<laughs> All Intel executives do love each other, correct? <laughs> we are, yes, absolutely. Right. Hi, I'm Maribel Lopez. I'm the founder of Lopez Research. Thank you for attending our fireside chat. Uh, we're here to talk about AI, cloud, edge, all things technology. Um, as a research firm, we do lots of surveys. Uh, no surprise, 86% of the companies we spoke to said they thought AI would be strategic to their business. Well, only 36% of them thought that they were actually making progress with AI and were moving into their second or third phases of using the technology in a way that they thought was meaningful. So lots of room for opportunity and growth. Out of those companies, um, nearly all of them said that they were using multiple types of technologies to support their uh, machine learning uh, inference and training solutions. So the landscape is interesting. It's complicated. Uh, there's a lot of technology change. I think one of the things that we always talk to about people with strategies is to make sure that as you're embarking on your journey, that you're constantly evaluating what's new because things are new all the time right now. And it's one of the more fast-paced, exciting industries. And to that note, we have two great seasoned executives from Intel that have been at the forefront of a lot of these technologies here today to talk to us about, no laughing, <laughs> to talk to us about. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a neuroscientist by training, so not a seasoned executive. I think, I think that counts. OK. Somehow. All right. At any rate, I, I'm just going to get kick started, uh, and we'll save some room for questions at the end. Sound good? All right, let's take it away. So um, when we look at it, we've seen that people are using what I call all the various acronym soup. There are CPUs, GPUs, TPUs, VPUs, and NNPs. So there's a lot going on in the space. Jonathan, I know that you have been doing a lot of work with various customers all up and down the stack. How do you see that things have changed over the past year in this AI field? What are people doing now that they didn't do before? Well, I think um, what's changed is really um, just a uh, first more access. And we talked about that in the last session. Uh, the democratization of, of AI has gone from limited to the, uh, you know, academics and large tech companies that had vast amounts of resources or access to vast amounts of data. And now, through tools and awareness and training, we've got um, pretty much every industry being able to take advantage of the technology. And, as it relates to you know, some of the computing architectures you're talking about, I think we've gone from this place where over the last several years, um, AI equaled the GPU uh, in the minds of you know, the layman. Uh, now, uh, people are understanding that it's a lot more complicated than that, and that it requires a heterogeneous architecture, and that the GPU is great at a lot of things, but also um, having a CPU with an accelerator like an FPGA or a neural network um, processor or a vision processing unit. There's so many different configurations, and it really depends on the use case. So if you're doing something that is uh, cloud-based and you've got access to vast computing resources and um, you know, uh, power and cooling and all of these things, you can, uh, you can perform certain uh, tasks. But uh, what we're finding is that you know, almost half of all of the deployments and half of all the world's data uh, sits outside of a data center. And so customers are looking for the ability to access that data at the point of origination, be able to move, store, process that data locally. Um, and that re requires a completely different architecture. And they're, they're doing that um, because they don't have access to vast computing resources. They are power constrained. They're heat constrained. They uh, require uh, you know, low latency. Um, they require synchronized uh, assets in the case of robots on an assembly line. Uh, they may not have access to bandwidth uh, or connectivity costs are prohibitive. There's lots of reasons why people are doing things at the edge. Um, and then they'll tr maybe train in the data center. And so you're seeing this emergence of this distributed computing architecture that academics have been talking about for decades, it's, it's here. And I think we've seen that it's an interesting intersection between the trend of AI and the trend of IoT. Because I think when we first started, we thought that we would take all of the data from the devices and put it in the cloud. And over time, we realized that for the various reasons that you just enumerated, that that wasn't necessarily the, the right architectural path to do that. I, I want to switch to Amir for a minute. 
Amir, we were on stage, I, I think it was about a year ago, mm -hmm. and we were talking about AI. What has changed in your mind? What is the state of AI today? So last year, I made an argument that was um, largely incorrect. So thanks for uh, showing me up. <laughs> but uh, last year, I argued for uh, against this trend of more compute, more data, leading to uh, better models. And the reasons for that is that um, deep learning, machine learning today seems wildly wasteful uh, in terms of you need to have many images of cats to recognize cats. So I still uh, adhere to this principle, and maybe it's true for the demographic here. You have businesses, you're trying to solve problems, you have products that depend on AI. I think that idea is still relevant. However, I'm very mindful of this pretty remarkable development in the last six months of two entities. Actually, yesterday, um, Ilya Suskever and Greg Brockman from OpenAI were sitting in our chairs. And this entity has come up with this really transformative and powerful AI technology that has depended on the converse of what I've said. So just to give you an example, give some examples. So there's GPT-2, which is a language model. And there is Dota 2, a game playing engine, a video game playing engine against human adversaries, a team of human adversaries. And uh, Ilya himself has said the reason why they've been able to beat, for example, in the case of Dota 2, these individuals, it's a remarkable achievement. It is actually a, a, a will be transformative. You will see this technology in your businesses, I, I bet, in two years. Um, what's enabled it is scaling up processing and compute and running uh, all of the stuff on specialized hardware and infrastructure for these problems. So not GPUs, but for example, what I think Google has completely nailed it with this TPU cloud that they built, um, bespoke processor, cooling, infrastructure, software, frameworks, and so forth that's really enabled this technology. And it depends on an enormous amount of compute. So the real magic of AI is in the training and these transformative technologies have been developed by the converse of what I said last year, by scaling up compute. And Ilya said, it is, sounds like counterintuitive, when is this trend gonna stop? But he said he would not bet on it, and we're not betting on it uh, either. We're actually betting um, for these kinds of developments. We have a neural network training processor that's gonna come out very soon, and we'll be able to build supercomputers, neural network supercomputers for all our other customers who now see this gap that they don't have a Google TPU and they, they need one. That's okay. the main development, I think, of the last year. That's great. I'm gonna circle back on that point in a minute, but uh, I wanna to go to Jonathan because you mentioned the million pictures of cats, which right. makes me think of vision, uh, which makes me think, can you talk a little bit, Jonathan, about how you're seeing people use vision in their use cases today that might have been different than the million pictures of cats that we've trained? Yeah, um, I mean, this is, uh, without question, vision, computer vision has been the, what I call the eye of IoT, um, pun intended. Uh, it has been completely transforming every industry. And, you know, when I think about um, just IoT in general, we've been down this path for the last, you know, decade where anything that can compute and connect to the network uh, ha has been doing that. And that's been great for uh, what I would call creating smart things. Um, but where things get interesting is when things can become intelligent. So smart things can think and communicate, but intelligent things can learn. And that's where AI and deep learning comes in. And this has been especially true uh, with computer vision where um, you know, for seven or eight years, we've been very aggressively going after and participating in um, smart cities. And smart cities, uh, you know, there are just <laughs> tremendous amounts of opportunity uh, to save lives, to make um, our, uh, uh, our days more efficient, to reduce CO2 emissions, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the camera is playing a key role in this, um, which historically has been around you know, the security and the safety of communities and uh, arenas, sports arenas and, and airports and things of this nature now are being used to automate traffic, to um, automate uh, parking systems, to be able to detect uh, not uh, after the fact accidents, but be able to predict uh, when accidents may occur at um, deadly intersections so that pedestrians and cyclists are, are more safe. And um, 
the, the algorithms that we've been developing for these types of use cases are now going into every industry. So cameras are now going into retail environments and being able to understand uh, the demographics of the shopper, how they're moving about the store, if the product is miscategorized on the shelf or running low in inventory, um, and even being now used to create a frictionless um, checkout experience. So you, uh, familiar with Amazon Go and JD.com and Carefor and Tesco and Kroger and everyone that's now moving towards this model using cameras to basically help you um, move through the store more efficiently. Um, it's happening in the transportation industry. We've got 330 million uh, trucks and vans around the world that are moving product from place to place and making sure that those uh, uh, drivers are being safe. So putting cameras in the vehicle to make sure that uh, the driver's not nodding off, or to make sure that they're not uh, looking at their cell phone while they're uh, driving. Uh, it's going into uh, manufacturing environments, cameras on assembly lines to look for quality defects with uh, algorithms that are uh, approaching 100% accuracy in detecting um, known defects, which not only improves the quality of products coming off the line, but um, uh, dramatically reduces costs of, of rework. I mean, I could go on all day. Uh, computer vision is impacting uh, everything we do, every industry, and it's a great use case for, for what's happening at the edge on camera. Okay, so, but we had computer vision before. Is it that the software is different now? Like, why is it working now? Well, before we were using, you know, traditional computer vision methods uh, and open, you know, standards like OpenCV, OpenVX. Uh, what's different now is that we have the ability to, and you've heard lots of examples this week about how for image analytics in healthcare, uh, the neural nets have the ability to uh, not only detect uh, at greater than human accuracy, but they have the ability to learn as the data set um, grows. And the same is true for any image, whether it's a still image on a four terabyte MR file, or it's uh, you know, a 4K uh, video stream. And so it's uh, all the principles of, of computer vision and machine learning that we're applying uh, in a deep learning context to uh, CV. Got it. Um, Amir, circling back to you. Uh, you mentioned TPU, you mentioned NMP. Uh, can you tell me, is there a difference between those two? Uh, why would you want one? What would you do with it? Um, so good question. So I'll, should I just define the term? So TPU stands for Tensor Processing Unit, and it's Google's brand uh, for their processor. And ours is called the Neural Network Processor, NNP. And they fall into the same class of processors. There are salient differences between them. The architectures are different. And potentially, um, one, uh, the TPU essentially has a large thing that does uh, compute. Ours has a tiling of things that do compute. However, they're built in the same spirit. And actually, the origins are from the same people and the same ideas. Uh, the, the main concept is you have a single processor, but you want to actually have one giant processor that's built up of a mesh of these processors working in concert. To really have things uh, work in concert for machine learning primitives like matrix multiplication, there are certain things you have to do. And that means you have to have interconnects that are specialized, low latency, high bandwidth interconnects between the processors so you can scale things. You have to have pretty clever software, which is quite challenging. It's one of our biggest challenges to build software for these large-scale new systems. They're not HPC systems. So there is this misnomer that HPC and AI are converging. I keep hearing this. But in the most salient and important aspects, they're diverging quite a bit. And it ties into the story of OpenAI um, and DeepMind that I mentioned earlier. But the kinds of compute that they're doing with these large-scale array of TPUs and NMPs is quite different than doing numerical simulations of weather or of galaxy formation and so forth. It's very narrow and specific. GPUs have to run on the order of 100x more different kinds of workloads than uh, TPUs and NMPs. So these processors, coming back to your question, are highly specialized for a very limited set of com compute primitives that they have to do at large scale over and over again very efficiently. And we're lucky that this results in these really dramatic improvements in algorithmic performance. Uh, it's m mysterious to me. So I started this, in field in, this field in 2005. I was actually studying the, the eye and computer vision. 
And it's really remarkable, and just in the last year, how much the algorithmic performance has improved. Well, so. if, if, if it's amazing to you, it's got to be amazing to everybody. <laughs> so are you guys amazed? Awesome. A little bit? Yes, you are Somewhat. amazed. Um, <laughs> OK, so you talked a bit about specialization. Is this something where I think that you know everybody needs an NNP, or is it only certain types of industries? I mean, you, you mentioned it's certain types of use cases. Mm -hmm. So getting back to what Jonathan said earlier, this con concept of heterogeneity. So humans like order and fewer things and simpler things. So unfortunately, this field is exploding. And you should expect more things and more complexity in some sense. We're trying to wrangle things together. So at the hardware um, level, which Intel is, uh, has the most prowess in, you're going to see more things. And you're going to see CPUs, GPUs, NNPs, TPUs, FPGAs. What was it? You had a BPU? What's that? Vision processing? No, oh, VPU. B, OK, V, not B. Victor. <laughs> uh, and then we're, we're building the software stack on top of it together to uh, allow these things, uh, the complexity to be hidden to some extent. However, in the software area, there's also fragmentation. And at the very top, there's all sorts of stuff. And people are trying to build monolithic systems. That's a huge mistake. I've done it already twice. Um, it, there's just <laughs> going to be a rich set of things, and we have to deal with it. Because the field is exploding. That's a great thing. Um, and I forgot your original question. That's good enough. Um, We're good. Um, I'm going to pop over to JB. I'm going to ask JB a question. And then I'm going to go out to the audience for questions. So get your questions ready. Um, Obviously, we were just talking about how we have many different tools in our AI toolkit that we can use. Um, what are some of the pitfalls that people should be thinking about to try to avoid? What advice do you have for them in terms of think, how to think about the whole AI landscape right now? Yeah, so um, it's a really important question. And I, you know, I would go back to where we were you know, just a, a few short years ago. Uh, back to my opening comments about AI being limited to those with, that had the, 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 the best resources, the, you know, the most programming capabilities, um, the biggest data sets. And this idea of democratization, I think we're just getting started. And so it, start, you know, it began with you know, TensorFlow and Onyx and uh, you know, all the, uh, the framework tools uh, started making uh, network development a lot more accessible. But when you look at the um, the workflow associated with actually deploying an AI model, um, it's, it is fragmented, to Amir's point. And um, it's, I think there's a tremendous opportunity, first, is to make the developer experience very streamlined. right? And to the degree that we can obfuscate hardware architecture from you know, the data scientist or the application developer, that's going to go a long way. Um, but today, we're not there yet. And so until we get to that point, I think it's incumbent upon uh, software developers to understand both the pros and the cons, the limitations of various uh, hardware choices. Because they are, um, be because we have, are operating in this heterogeneous you know, uh, genius, uh, time, uh, choosing one hardware architecture over another can be a hugely um, uh, costly uh, mistake um, down the road. Um, and so I, I've been cautioning our customers to think about things, not in terms of raw performance, because I think everyone's been thinking about things in raw performance, but when you actually apply a real world use case to your architecture, then you get into a, a much more rich um, analysis around what the right answer is. And so I've been looking, um, in the case of computer vision, which you brought up, at helping customers think about things in terms of performance per watt if they're doing things outside of a data center, or the ultimate TCO metric, which is performance per watt per dollar. And if you think about things in that context, um, and you also apply all of these other you know, constraints that you may have, so let, let, I'll take an example of a factory. I talked about machine vision and the factory floor. Um, in a lot of factories, you can't have moving parts. right? So you can't have a fan, because a fan creates particulate matter and potentially could create a spark. So in that case, you need to go for a computing architecture that is fanless. Um, and so that's a consideration that you need to factor into your architectural choice. In some cases, you're working in a remote um, location that may have limited or not reliable power. So you need to factor your power constraints in. There's lots of different things. And I think it's incumbent upon the industry, companies like ours, to make that easy. 
and to, um, to the degree we can obfuscate a lot of those things and have recommendation engines and other things so that based on whatever model you've developed, we can optimize that model for the environment, for the use case. Amir, I do have one more question for you. Okay. If you were a data scientist right now, what, well, meaning they're data scientists right now, what should they be looking at? What should they be looking forward to? Is there a specific trend that they should be following? Mm, so um, along the lines of what Jonathan said, that there is a software ecosystem that is evolving to make things easier. Um, there's another trend to make it also richer. So uh, as a data scientist, you uh, are confronted with idiosyncratic business problems. You're all, I've, I've talked to some of you, and it's we've been quite interesting. It's, you can't take TensorFlow, download ImageNet, and then solve all of your problems. Everyone knows that by now. It's one of the main trends of the last year. However, these ecosystems are growing horizontally. TensorFlow has serving, quantization for edge, for, and it also has new features such as privacy. So there are outstanding challenges in our business, such as data privacy. And I guess I would suggest to the data scientists to look for technological solutions to these problems. So in the case of privacy, data, data is very sensitive. Machine learning models depend on data. However, there's a burgeoning area of what's called um, privacy-preserving machine learning. There are techniques like homomorphic encryption, differential privacy, federated learning, multi-party computation. These are really complex terms. However, there's already libraries for them that uh, allow you, enable you to do machine learning in private. Wonderful. Thank you. We have time for one question. Anybody have a question? I can't quite. There's one in the back. Hi guys, thanks. Uh, just wondering if you're, you're looking at quantum computing and how that fits in, in the architecture stack. Oh, can I answer that? <laughs> yes, you can answer that. Amir. So um, I will not answer the question, unfortunately. However, uh, I will answer a different question. That's a, that's a tactic for answering questions. It's completely valid. Uh, so um, what I'm most uh, excited about at Intel, I rarely get a chance to uh, talk about it, thank you. Um, is that the future of our field, and one of the reasons why I'm at Intel, I'm very excited, um, is five years out, we're gonna be using different kind of materials to build processors from. So we have an NMP today, it's a simple architecture. I can see I'm very excited by the prospects of replacing the technology, underlying technology, with new stuff. So the word quantum comes in here uh, in the sense that Intel has built new kinds of transistors that are using room temperature quantum materials, things like ferroelectrics and magnetoelectric devices, relying on spin orbit and momentum and so forth. You can look it up, we publish it openly. One of our transistors is called MESO, it's a magnetoelectric spin orbital transistor, I apologize for the See terminology. That fast. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we don't have to cool things down to zero Kelvin. There are uh, novel uh, materials that um, we can exploit for the future of edge computing or data center computing. And I think, I, I really think this is actually the future of our field. It is so esoteric sounding, but it's not. And um, I get a, a thank you for asking that question. So we are, quantum computing, I feel like we're over-invested in it. There are room temperature quantum materials that you can, you can use for creating new kinds of transistors that can do memory, interconnect, and compute. Uh, doesn't have to be science fiction-y at all. It can just be Boolean logic, and we look forward to it in the next couple of years. And I'm hoping all the excitement around AI will really accelerate this very difficult area to wrangle to bring these new materials uh, um, to, into products. Intel, this is one of Intel's core strengths. This is what Intel was founded on, this principles. So, quick follow-up to that. So. Um, one of the things we talked about in quantum is that you have to learn how to think about programming differently. Uh, will that be the same in the types of technologies you're talking about? Um, so quantum computing relies on, uh, actually my training was in quantum field theory uh, a long time ago. I'm glad I got out of that. Um, so quantum computing and quantum field theory are different, but the mathematics for quantum computing are different than the mathematics for um, deep learning and um, most of the things we do. And I would argue that quantum, field, quantum computing is a very interesting area. However, you can still do Boolean logic, but exploiting quantum materials. And that's a different idea that's wildly underinvested. It's even difficult at our company to articulate this to people. Hopefully you're convinced. 
<laughs> and there no. you have it. You heard it I wrote the first. white paper, man. What are you talking about? <laughs> okay, good. I'm kidding. Well, thank you. That's all the time we have today. All right, thanks.